Rui, Rui, toma. Okay. Um, boa tarde a todos. Um, antes de antes mais, obrigado por virem. E um, tenho só um, uma, um pequeno discursozinho, uma frase para dizer antes do, do Stallman entrar. Toda a gente sabe o que é que estamos aqui a fazer e eu vou dizer em inglês. Vou tentar, pelo menos, dizer. So, everyone knows what this is all about or wants to know. I have one thing to say to you. Whether if you are a free software enthusiast or not, I'm sure you have much to learn with this talk. So with you, Dr. Richard Stallman from GNU Project. Please raise your hand if you cannot hear me. <laughs> A couple of preliminary requests. First, if you take photos of me, please do not put them on Facebook. <laughs> Facebook is not your friend. Facebook is a surveillance engine. If photos of people are posted on Facebook, Facebook solicits information about who is in the photo in order to build up its surveillance database. I'd rather that Facebook not have any information about my whereabouts. So please don't put photos of me in Facebook and you should really think twice before putting photos of anybody in Facebook unless it's somebody you hate. Second, if you make an audio or video recording and you want to distribute copies, that's okay, but only in the formats that are favorable to free software. Those are the AUG formats and WebM. No MP3, no MPEG, certainly not Flash. <laughs> and Please put on those recordings the Creative Commons No Derivatives License because this is a statement of my personal views. So, <clears throat> what is free software? Free software is software that respects freedom and community. So it's free as in freedom, it's livre, it's not gratis. It's not a matter of price at all. Price is just a detail, which is not a big ethical issue for something that's not a matter of life and death. On the other hand, freedom and community are important. So I'm going to focus on something more important and not on price. So to understand the term free software, think of free speech, not free beer. <laughs> and uh, if you are speaking about this in Portuguese, please don't use the English word free. Say livre, it'll be clearer. And that's after all the point, to communicate the idea clearly. If a program is not free, we call it non-free, proprietary, user-subjugating software. <laughs> Because a non-free program generates a system of unjust power of the developer over the users. It's a system of digital colonization 
which like any colonial system, keeps people divided and helpless. The users are divided because they're forbidden to redistribute the program and they're helpless because they don't have the source code so they can't change it. They can't even verify independently what that pre program really does to And quite often, non-free programs have malicious features, which I'll tell you more about in a little bit. So, <clears throat> non-free software is an injustice. Software should be free. But what I've said is very general. It respects freedom and community. I have to be more specific. A program is free software if you, the user, have the four essential freedoms. Freedom zero is the freedom to run the program as you wish. Freedom one is the freedom to study the source code and change it so the program does your computing the way you wish. Freedom two is the freedom to help others, to make exact copies and distribute them to others when you wish. And freedom three is the freedom to make copies of your modified versions and distribute them to others when you wish. <clears throat> so, a program, well, so if the program gives you these four freedoms, then it's free software because the social system of its distribution and use is an ethical system, one that respects freedom and community. But if one of these freedoms is missing or insufficient, then the program is proprietary because it imposes an unethical, unjust social system on its users. In order to be sufficient, these freedoms must apply to all activities in life, including doing business, because you shouldn't be subjugated by somebody else in anything that you do. However, the four things that you're free to do, you're not required to do. We don't demand that you do these things, you must only be free to do them if you choose. Thus, with Freedom Zero, you're free to run the program as you wish. But if you're a masochist, you can also run it as you don't wish. <laughs> and you're also free not to run it at all. With Freedom One, you're free to study and change the source code, but that's not required. You can get the program and start running it right away. You don't, you're not required to study any source code, which is convenient for a lot of users who don't know how. The non-programmers use free software too. <clears throat> With Freedom Two, you're free to make copies and distribute them, but this is not required. We don't tell you you must distribute copies. The point is you should be free to do so when and if you wish. Sometimes you may feel that you're morally obligated to give someone a copy because it's the right thing to do. Well, that's okay, but uh, I sometimes feel that way too. But the point is it's not an it's not a command imposed on you. It comes from your conscience. And with Freedom 3, you can make copies of your modified versions and distribute them to others. But that's not a requirement. You can also use the modified version privately. So, the distinction between free and proprietary software is not a technical distinction. It's not a question of the features the program has. It's not a question of how the code works. And it's not a question of how the code was written. Those are just technical details. This distinction is an ethical, social, and political distinction which is why it's so important, more important than any mere technical question. The use in society of free software is development because that program embodies knowledge and because it's free, the knowledge is available for the users to understand and then to maintain, adapt, and extend and also use in other ways. 
but the use of a proprietary program in society is not development, it's dependence. Dependence on a particular party. And that is a social problem. So we should aim to get rid of the use of proprietary software. Ideally, it would not exist anymore. And that's the ideal that we work towards. To write a free program is a contribution to society. How much of a contribution? That depends on the details. Uh, but at least if it's free software, it's distributed in a way that permits it to contribute whatever it has to offer to society. But writing a proprietary program is no contribution because it's a power grab. In social terms, that program is a trap. If it has attractive features, those are the bait for the trap. Their purpose is to attract users to fall into the trap and lose their freedom. So, paradoxically, those attractive features don't make the proprietary program better. They make it more harmful. So, if you have the choice to either write a proprietary program or do nothing, it's better to do nothing because that way you don't do harm. Of course, in real life, you'd probably have some other alternative better than both of these. But the point is, the worst thing you could ever do is write a proprietary program don't, that is in the software field. So don't ever do that. So the goal of the free software movement is to make all programs free so that all their users can be free. But what makes these four freedoms essential? Why define free software this way? Each freedom has a reason. Freedom two, the freedom to make and distribute exact copies, the freedom to help others, is essential on fundamental moral grounds so you can live an upright ethical life as a good member of your community. If you use a program without freedom too, you are in danger of falling into a moral dilemma at any moment whenever your good friend says, that program looks convenient, could I have a copy? You will then face a choice between two evils. One evil is to give your friend a copy and violate the license of the program. The other evil is to refuse your friend is a copy and comply with the license of the program. If you are in this dilemma, you ought to choose the lesser evil, which is to give your good friend a copy and violate the license of the program. Why is this the lesser evil? Because if you can't avoid doing wrong to somebody or other, it's less bad to do wrong to somebody who deserves it because he's done wrong. <laughs> we can assume that your good friend is a good member of your community and normally deserves your cooperation. That's the usual case for a good friend. But the developer of this proprietary program has deliberately attacked the social solidarity of your community. And that's very bad. So if you must do wrong to one or the other, do it to the developer. But being the lesser evil does not mean it's good. It's never good to make an agreement and break it. Not even when the agreement is inherently evil like this agreement and keeping it is worse than breaking it. Still, breaking it is not good. And if you give your good friend a copy, what will she have? She will have an unauthorized copy of a proprietary program. And that's a rather nasty thing almost as nasty as an authorized copy of the same program. <laughs> it's nasty because it's proprietary. So, when you have fully understood this issue, what should you really do? 
you should make sure you don't fall into the dilemma. I know two ways. One is don't have any friends. <laughs> That's what the proprietary developers have in mind for your future. No friends, at least no real friends. You could have Facebook friends instead. <laughs> The other method, my method, is reject that program. If you don't have a copy, you can't fall into the dilemma. You don't have to worry what you would say. You'd say, I can't give you a copy of that because I don't have one. Very simple. So, if someone offers me a program, no matter how attractive and convenient it might be, on the condition that I not share it with you, I tell him, my conscience does not permit me to accept those conditions that you put on this program. They're evil, so I won't use the program and take it out of here. That's what you should say, too. Reject, on moral grounds, any program without freedom, too. And reject also the propaganda terms that the proprietary developers use to demonize cooperation and sharing. Terms like pirate. When they call people who share pirates, what are they really saying? They're saying that helping other people is the moral equivalent of attacking ships. <laughs> Morally speaking, that's as wrong as you can get because Attacking ships is very bad, but sharing is good. So let's not call them both by the same word. That's propaganda for the enemy. So when people ask me what I think of piracy, I say, attacking ships is very bad. <laughs> Oops. Could somebody be so kind as to pick that up for me? And when someone asks what I think of music piracy, I say, well, I saw the Pirates of Penzance once, and it was nice. <laughs> and if they ask what I think of movie piracy, I could say that the first Pirates of the Caribbean was pretty good. Well, you get the point. I look for funny, pointed ways to reject their propaganda meaning because if I accepted it, if I made a statement using the word, quote, piracy, unquote, to refer to sharing, I would be repeating enemy propaganda. And that would be helping the enemy. So let's reject software that we're forbidden to share and reject also the propaganda terms that demonize sharing. That's the reason for freedom too, the freedom to help others, the freedom to redistribute exact copies, essential on fundamental moral grounds. Freedom zero, the freedom to run the program as you wish, is essential for a different reason, so you can control your computing. All users deserve to control their computing. That's my basic premise. So, Freedom Zero means you can run it however you wish, to do whatever you wish to do. And <clears throat> to see why this is essential, notice that there are programs, proprietary programs, whose licenses restrict even the use of authorized copies. For instance, there's a program for managing websites whose license forbids using it to publish anything that criticizes the program's developer. In this case, proprietary software literally denies the user's freedom of speech. If you can't even freely use the copy you're supposed to use, you don't control your computing. So freedom zero is essential. But it's not enough because that's merely the freedom to either do or not do whatever the code of the program is already set up to be able to do. 
which means the developer continues imposing his decisions on you, not through the license if you have freedom zero, but instead through the code itself. Because the code is written so it can do certain things and can't do other things. So in order to have control of your computing, you need freedom one, which is the freedom to study the source code and change it so the program does your computing the way you wish. This way you decide instead of letting him decide for you. And note that I say, so that it does your computing the way you wish. This means freedom one includes the real possibility of using your version in place of the version you got. There are devices that we call tyrants that have software in them but they, and they let the manufacturer provide modified versions, but they don't let the user provide modified versions. Well, if a free program's executable is inside that device, then you don't have control over it. You can't change the, the executable in that device. Someone else can, that is the developer, but you can't. Well, that isn't Freedom 1. Freedom 1 includes really being able to use your version. Now, if you don't have Freedom 1, you not only can't change the program, you can't even tell what it really does to you. And many of these programs have malicious features. Malicious features do things like spy on the user and send data about the use of the machine to some server, or they restrict what the user can do with the data in his own computer. These are known as digital handcuffs or DRM, digital restrictions management. And there are back doors. Back doors receive commands from somebody else and do things to the user that the user might not like. And this is not a rare danger. This is the usual case. Almost every user of non-free software is the victim of malicious features. Let me prove it. Just by listing some proprietary packages with known specific malicious features. One proprietary package that has all three kinds of malicious features that you may have heard of is called Microsoft Windows. <laughs> and I'm talking about specific features that we have documented the existence of. This is not speculation. Now, they include spy features, digital handcuffs, and backdoors. One backdoor in Windows is universal. It allows Microsoft to remotely impose changes in software without asking permission of the nominal owner of the computer. I say nominal owner because really once uh, Windows is running in that computer, Microsoft has owned that computer. This means that any malicious feature which is not present in Windows today could be forcibly installed tomorrow. In other words, Windows is not just malware, it's universal malware. But it's not unique in being malware. The Macintosh system is malware. It has digital handcuffs. The software in the iThings, Apple's newer products, is much worse malware because, well, people have found two spy features in the past year in it, and it has the tightest digital handcuffs ever. Apple is the pioneer in making the tightest digital handcuffs. For the first time in general purpose computers, Apple seized power over the installation of applications. Users of the iThings are not even free to install whatever software they want. 
They can only install things from Apple's App Store, and Apple, which of course is censorship. But when Apple chooses which applications to approve, part of its criteria are censorship of the, of the substance of what it presents to the user. So <clears throat> it's, it's got to the point where these products are effectively jails for their users. And, it's, and I'm not the one who first said that. It's the users, when they referred to breaking that particular part of the digital handcuffs as jailbreaking, who effectively said that those products are jails. So Apple's computer products are malware. It's the software that's the malware, of course. With different software, those products would not be harmful. Um, Flash Player is malware. It has a surveillance feature and digital handcuffs. Flash Player is gratis, but it's not livre. A lot of people think it's okay because it's gratis. But really, what difference does that make? It means that Adobe does not make people pay to be abused. <laughs> the PlayStation 3 software is malware. It was designed with digital handcuffs of many kinds. And then people figured out a way to replace that software and Sony sent the police after them, which is why we now <clears throat> call for a total boycott of Sony. Don't buy anything from Sony. And the Amazon swindle is malware. Of course, that's not its official name. I'm talking about an e-reader, a reader for e-books, which swindles people out of the traditional freedoms of readers of books. For instance, there's the freedom to acquire a book anonymously by paying cash, which is the only way I buy books. I will not identify myself to be listed in a database. But that's impossible with the swindle because the only place to get most modern books that are in print is from Amazon. And Amazon makes users identify themselves. That means Amazon maintains a giant database of all the books that each user has read. Such a database is a threat to human rights. We can't tolerate its existence. Then there's the freedom to read a book and give it to someone else, or to lend the book to various people, and even the freedom to sell the book, perhaps to a used bookstore. Amazon eliminates all these freedoms with digital handcuffs and also with end-user license agreements, because Amazon, at least in some countries, says, that users can't own books. Amazon has contempt for private property. So the users can't own a book. All they can do is get a license to read it under Amazon's conditions. And then there's the freedom to keep the book as long as you wish and someday pass it on to your heirs. Amazon eliminates this freedom with a back door in the swindle. Since we can't read the code, we don't know all the things that this back door can do. We know one thing it can do. It can be used to remotely delete books. We know this by observation. Because in 2009, Amazon deleted thousands of copies of a particular book. Those were authorized copies obtained directly from Amazon until the day Amazon deleted them. And you know which book Amazon used to demonstrate the Orwellian nature of its product? It was 1984 by George Orwell.
Afterwards, there was a lot of criticism. So Amazon did what companies that are criticized often do. Namely, it promised to not quite correct the problem. Amazon promised that it would never do this again unless ordered to do so by the state. Which I do not find comforting, especially considering what the totalitarian state in 1984 did to books. Trusting to the state to respect our freedom is something we should only do to the extent we need to. So you should all read 1984, but not on the swindle. Now, the official name of that product is the Kindle. Kindle means to start a fire, which I think is meant to hint that its purpose is to burn our books. <laughs> but it's not going to get mine because I'm never going to have my books in such a product, and I hope you never will either. Finally, con as an example of non-free software with malicious features, consider the software in most portable phones. That has a spy feature. It will send the GPS location. And it has a back door, a universal back door, which allows, at least in most cases, allows the phone company to change the software. And this can be used to convert it into a listening device, which transmits all the sound that the phone gets to hear. So you've heard of software that has bugs, but this software is a bug. Well, I have just listed non-free software, which is used by most of the users of non-free software. So I've listed specific malicious pro malware programs, which most non-free software users are using. And so I've proved that most users of non-free software are using, are the victims of malicious features. But that leaves thousands of other non-free programs which we don't know anything about. We don't know if they have malicious features. And how can we tell? We can't study the source code, the developer, the same one who might perhaps have put in malicious features, also prevents us from checking for malicious features. So these programs, every program without Freedom One, is just trust me software. It's we're a corporation. You know corporations would never be bad to you, software. <laughs> so you must treat any program without Freedom One as potential malware. But supposing that there are some which don't have malicious features, they have errors because their developers are human and they make mistakes. So the code of those programs has bugs and the user of a program without Freedom One is just as helpless facing an accidental error as facing a deliberate malicious feature. If you use a program without Freedom One, you're a prisoner of the program. We free software developers are human too. So we also make mistakes. Our free programs have bugs too, because it's inevitable. Every non-trivial program has bugs. But if you find a bug in our free code or anything in the code you don't like, you are free to change it because we did not make you our prisoner. We can't be perfect. We can respect your freedom. So freedom one is essential. But it's not enough, because that's the freedom to either to, to study and change the source code 
personally or within one organization. That's not enough because there are millions of users that don't know how to program. They are not capable of directly exercising Freedom One. But even for programmers like me, Freedom One's not enough because we're busy doing certain things. We don't have time to do everything else. And there is so much free software in the world already that no one user can possibly study and master all the source code of the programs that she uses, nor personally write all the changes she might want. That's more work than one human being can do. So the only way we can fully have control of our computing is to do it by work, is to do it working together, cooperating. And for that, we need Freedom 3. Freedom 3, first of all, allows several users of a free program to work together making changes because they can pass their changes back and forth between them. But then, once they have a, an improved version that they're satisfied with, they can also distribute that to others. They can publish it. And then every user can run it or not, as he prefers. Even the users that don't know how to program can get the benefit of these improvements. And this is how the freedom to change the software benefits the people who don't know how to change software. They get the benefit anyway, indirectly, by, because they get to run those improvements if they want. Without Freedom 3, yes, each one of us would be free to write this change alone. But what a waste it would be writing the same change millions of times. And the people who don't know how to program would be left out completely. This is not adequate, so Freedom 3 is essential. And thus, all users get the benefit of the four freedoms. Every user can exercise freedom zero and two, the freedom to run the program as you wish and the freedom to redistribute exact copies. These don't require programming, so every user can do them. Freedoms one and three, the freedom to study and change the source code and then optionally distribute copies of your modified version, these involve programming. So any given user is capable of doing these things more or less according to how much she knows how to program. And if many people can make simple changes, which is useful. It's much better than not being able to make any change, which is the way it is with proprietary software. But it's true that m most users don't know how to program at all, and they don't make any changes. So they can't directly exercise freedoms one and three, but they still get the benefit of living in a society where the users have freedoms one and three, because when other users of the same program, people who are programmers, make changes, and when they publish their modified versions, then everybody gets to use them if he wishes. So all users benefit from the four freedoms. It's not just programmers who do. And the, the four freedoms are the only known defense against malware. The reason malicious features are so common in proprietary software is the developer knows he has power over the users, so he feels temptation to use that power to gain further advantage over them. And as you can see, the major companies have all given in to that temptation. Why indeed would they resist? They're corporations, they're psychopaths. <laughs> they think it's their duty to abuse whatever ounce of power they ever get. So <clears throat> how can we stop that? The only known defense is for the users to be able to change the program. 
because among the users of the program, there are people who are programmers. And sometimes they read the source code for various reasons. Maybe they want to add a feature. But in the process of reading the source code, they have a chance to spot malicious features. And then, of course, they can remove the malicious features and publish an improved version saying, this is improved, it's not malicious, it's not malware. Of course, that would be a big scandal and everyone would notice it. And the developer who put in that malicious feature would be hated and the users would escape, they'd get rid of it. Because the programmer, of course, certain programmers would make the change, but then everybody would get the improved version. They would all get rid of the malicious feature. So, this is, although this is not a perfect guaranteed defense, at least it's a defense. With proprietary software, the users are defenseless. They're totally at the mercy of the developer, and the developers know it. With free software, the users know that they don't, ha sorry, the developers know that they don't have power over the users, so they don't feel the same temptation, which means that malware, that malicious features are rare in free software to begin with. And we have a def the defense of the community, even supposing someone did put one in. So if you don't want malware, you've got to insist on free software. And the four freedoms give us something else, democracy. A free program develops democratically under the control of its users. Because every user is free to participate in society's decision about the future of the program, which is simply the sum total of the decisions the users make for what to do with it. By contrast, a proprietary program develops under the sole power of its developer. The developer controls it and through it controls the users. So that proprietary program is really just an instrument of power. Because ultimately with software there are just two possibilities. Either the users control the program or the program controls the users. In order for the users to have effective control over the program and what it does for them, they need the four freedoms. The four freedoms are essential because those are the freedoms the users need to control the program. If they don't have the four freedoms, then the program controls the users. And there's always somebody who controls the program and through it subjugates the users. So society has a choice to make. On one side we have individual freedom, social solidarity and democracy. On the other we have the sole power of the developer who can subjugate the users. Basically the program is an instrument of, to have power over the users whom he can then command, exploit and abuse. Society must reject proprietary software and choose free software. So the overall goal of the free software movement is the liberation of cyberspace and all of its inhabitants. We invite you to escape from proprietary software, to put it out of your life and come live with us in the free world that we have built for this purpose. I launched the free software movement in 1983. I wanted to make it possible to use computers and have freedom. That was impossible at the time because the computer won't do anything without an operating system installed. And at the time, all the operating systems for modern computers were proprietary. By the way, it's somewhat hot in here. Is there a ventilation system that can be turned on? I know it's not hot outside, but it's hot inside. 
Is there anything we can do? What? Good, okay, but I'll continue. I couldn't hear them at first, you see. You have to speak to me very clearly or I can't hear it. So, uh, all, the com all the operating systems for modern computers in 83 were proprietary. So if you bought a new computer, in order to make it do anything, you had to have a proprietary operating system in it, and there went your freedom. I was one man without much money, without much fame, outside of the users of the editor Emacs. And few people agreed with me. So I didn't think it would be possible to, to do something about this problem with an ordinary political movement protesting in the street, sending letters and so on. But, and besides, I had, I had no experience doing such a thing. I was not a political organizer. I was an operating system developer. But as an operating system developer, I had another way to, to do the same job, to achieve the same goal. All I had to do was write an operating system then I, as the author, could legally make it free software, and then everybody would be able to run computers in freedom by using my system. In other words, I could give people a way to escape from the injustice of proprietary software by doing technical work in my own field. I was aware of the injustice of proprietary software, which most people didn't recognize as an injustice. I had the skills necessary to give people an escape from this injustice, and it looked like nobody would do it if not me. That meant I had been elected by circumstances to do this work, it was my, to do this task, it was my duty. It's as if you see somebody drowning, and you know how to swim, and there's no one else around, and it's not Bush, then you have a moral duty to save this person. <laughs> well, perhaps that statement is too strong. Perhaps there are some other people we could identify about whom I should not make the claim that you have a moral duty to save them, like uh, Cheney and Obama and everyone else that supports torture and imprisonment without trial and wars of conquest and uh, putting people in prison for sharing. And <clears throat> but I don't have to resolve all those questions because I don't know how to swim. <laughs> However, in the case that really arose in my life, the work to be done was not swimming. It was writing lots of code. So, and, and that I knew how to do. So I decided to develop an operating system that would be entirely free software. Every line of code would be free software. Then I decided to recruit other people to help to finish it sooner. Then I decided to make it a Unix-like system because, first of all, that way it would be portable. And second, by making it compatible with Unix, the Unix users would be able to switch to my system easily. They would already know how to use it. And then I gave it a name, which is a joke. The name of the system is GNU, spelled G-N-U. And the joke is that it's a recursive acronym. GNU stands for GNU's not Unix. So it's G-N-U, GNU's not Unix. And I think that that more or less works in Portuguese also. However, in order to be a joke, it needs another meaning. Why GNU 
instead of enu, fnu, snu, unu, because those are not words. And without another meaning, it's not a joke. Gnu is a word. It's the name of this animal that lives in Africa. So there we have two meanings. Now it's a joke. <laughs> However, it's much better than that. Gnu is the most humor-charged word of the English language, used in countless word plays. Because according to the dictionary, the G is silent and is pronounced nu. So every time you want to write the word nu, you can spell it G-N-U and you've got a joke. Perhaps not a very good joke, but there are lots of them. So we have been conditioned to associate this word with humor. You, people see this word and they're already almost ready to laugh. So given a specific meaningful reason to use it as the name of a programming project, I couldn't resist. But when it's the name of our system, please do not follow the dictionary. Please pronounce a hard G. Please pronounce it GNU. If you say the new operating system, uh, well, you're actually making a mistake. We've been developing it for 28 years now and using it for 20 years, so it's not new anymore. <laughs> but it still is GNU, and it will always be GNU. So please avoid the mistake of pronouncing it new, and also please avoid saying GNU because that's so much work, other people won't want to say our name if they hear you say it that way. So say it the, say it the easy way. And uh, another erroneous pronunciation you need to avoid sounds like Linux. <laughs> Strange as it may seem, millions of people, when they talk about the GNU system, call it Linux. Uh, what happened was this mistake got started and then it spread faster than our correction spreads. So during the 1980s, our work in developing GNU was to come up with all the hundreds of components that we needed for a Unix-like system. Now, in some cases, we were lucky and somebody else wrote a suitable program and made it free. And they did that for some other reason. Uh, whatever reason it might be, we could take advantage of it. But when that didn't happen, we had to come up with, we, we had to make the program exist. So sometimes I wrote the program, sometimes I recruited somebody else to write it, sometimes I convinced somebody to free a proprietary program. For instance, in 1985, I believe, I visited the developers of BSD. BSD at the time was a proprietary version of Unix, it, to which people at UC Berkeley had added code, but that code was only available from them to people with AT&T source licenses for Unix. So it was proprietary. So I asked them to please separate their code from AT&T's code and release their parts as free software. And in a year or two they started doing that. The reason I asked them was I wanted to be able to use their code in GNU. And so we used some of it. By 1990, we had almost all the system, but one major essential component was missing. That was the kernel. The kernel is the component of an operating system that allocates the machine's resources to all the other programs. So. The Free Software Foundation in 1990 hired a programmer to write a kernel for GNU. I chose an advanced design based on a microkernel that already existed. I figured this way we would 
be able to start from a place above zero. We have left less to do, and then we'd have a more advanced system uh, superior to what Unix had as uh, in, the Unix, in Unix's kernel. Uh, it turns out that this design had ran into, th this project ran into various problems, some of which I understand, some I don't. It took six years to have a test release. It was somewhat of a research project, unfortunately. And one of the things about research is that not every idea works. In any case, we didn't have to wait for that, uh, fortunately, because in 1992, Mr. Torvalds, who had a proprietary kernel called Linux, decided to make it free. And he released it under the GNU General Public License. But what does that mean? Why does a free program have a license? You've probably seen or had your eyes glaze over at the licenses of proprietary software. Well, those licenses are, are contracts and they're meant to restrict the user even more than copyright does. But our licenses do just the opposite. They're meant to give the, back to the user freedoms that copyright law takes away. You see, under today's uh, unwisely designed copyright law, everything that's written is automatically copyrighted. And copyright law, by default, forbids various practices, such as to, uh, to, um, to copy it, to change it, to distribute it, and in many countries, even prohibits running the program, because running it requires copying it into main memory, and that's enough to be forbidden. So, how do we make any program free? The only way to do it is through a formal declaration on the part of the developers or copyright holders of the program giving the users the four freedoms. And we call that declaration a free software license. There are many ways to write a free software license. Any declaration that adequately, adequately gives people the four freedoms qualifies as a, as a free software license. And when we see it, we'll say, yes, this is a free software license. It's inconvenient in some ways that there are so many, but we can't deny the facts. If somebody writes a license and it qualifies, we have to say so. But there are differences among free software licenses. The GNU general public license is the one that I wrote. I wrote it to use it to publish the programs that we developed for GNU. But I wrote it so that anybody could easily release his pro program under the same license. And so that's what Torvalds did in 1992. He released his code for Linux under the GNU General Public License. Now, what's unusual about the GNU GPL and the reason why so many people use it is that it's a copyleft license. I think the Portuguese for copyleft is esquerdo autoral. Uh, but in any case, uh, what it means is what's important. You see, a copyleft license puts a condition on how you redistribute copies, whether it's with or without changes, freedom three or freedom two. The condition says when you redistribute, you must do so under the same license. 
And if you have put some of the code into another program, the entire pro other program has to be under this license. In other words, and you must provide the source code to the users. There are a series of conditions, but what they amount to is you must pass on to the next user the same freedoms that you got from us. Or looking at this from a different position in, in the same social activity, we will not let the intermediaries strip off the freedom and pass it on to you as proprietary software. We say that they're welcome to redistribute this, they're welcome to put some of the code into another combination, but whatever it is, when they pass it on to you, they must pass it on to you with the four freedoms. So the idea of copyleft is to make the four freedoms inalienable rights of all users which they cannot lose unless they do something that mistreats others, like distribute the program uh, and fail to, make, to respect the freedom of others. Then they can lose their license. But other than that, they can't lose these four freedoms. So there are free software licenses with copyleft and there are free software licenses without copyleft. All of these licenses respect the user's freedom. Copyleft licenses go further and actively defend freedom for every user. So when Linux was re-released under the GNU GPL, it became free software. And this newly freed program filled the last gap in the GNU system. But we were not the ones who put it into that gap because we had a, another kernel project and we thought it would be working soon. So it was other people who took Linux and took the various pieces that were waiting to be the GNU system and put them together. Of course, most of them already worked together because we already, after all, they were meant to be part of one system. So they just had to fit Linux in with the others and they got a complete system which was basically GNU, but also had Linux. But they didn't realize that. They were focused so much on this one component, Linux, the newest component, that they perceived all the rest as a small add-on to Linux. And so they began talking about this combination as a Linux system, and that's how the confusion got started. Other people imitated them, and so now millions of people use this variant of the GNU system and they don't know that that's what it is. They think the whole thing is Linux and that it was all started by Mr. Torvalds in 1991. Well, that's not nice to us. Please, if you appreciate this system, give us some of the credit for it. Please call the system GNU slash Linux. Give us equal mention. We did, after all, start the whole thing. We did write the biggest contribution to it. And we did provide the vision of the goal for where to end up. So please mention our name when you talk about the system. But it's true that credit is not the most important ethical issue in life. There's something much more important at stake in your choice of the name for this system. Your freedom is at stake. Indirectly, of course, because directly the name doesn't change the thing. If you call roses onions, that won't change the roses. But it might get cooks confused. They'll say, get some onions, and someone will come back with these roses, and the cook will say, gee, what do I do with these? 
So it matters what names you call things. The words you choose determine the meaning of the message that you convey to others. And that's what influences their thoughts, which later guide their actions. Since 1983, the name GNU has been associated with our ideas of freedom and community with raising an ethical issue of whether users control their computing or not. But the name Linux is associated with different ideas, with the ideas of Mr. Torvalds. And what are they? Well, he doesn't agree with the free software movement. He doesn't believe that you, as a user of software, deserve freedom. He doesn't believe that he, as a user of software, deserves freedom. He says that he wants powerful, reliable software, and that he doesn't mind if it's proprietary. Well, he has a right to his views, but he doesn't have a right to cite the tremendous labor that we did for the sake of your freedom as if it were his work and use that as a basis to spread his opposition to our ideas. That's using a falsehood. The work we did to develop the system was motivated by exactly the goal he doesn't agree with. I wish he agreed, but he doesn't. And it's important for people to know why this system really exists. It's important for you to know and tell others, we made this system for your freedom. Because that's exactly what our community tends to forget about. Millions of people think the system is Linux, they think it was started by Mr. Torvalds in 1991, and they think it comes from his philosophy and his vision of, po of political life. And they tend to admire him tremendously and adopt his views without even considering ours, which means they don't learn to value their own freedom either. And that puts us all in danger because someday we're going to have to fight for our freedom and the people who haven't learned to value freedom will not be with us they won't know that there's anything to fight for. And we might lose because, we're, because they are not with us. We need to teach them now to value freedom so that they will stand with us. Europe is now in the process of deciding whether ACTA will be established and imposed on people or defeated. See, this is one time when we have to fight. And then there's going to be the fight against the unitary patent, which threatens to impose software patents on almost all the countries of Europe. Well, that's another fight that's coming soon. And there's always another. Microsoft is now engaged in a big power grab Microsoft wants all future PCs to be tyrant machines that won't allow users to install anything other than Windows. And you can find a, can a petition against this in fsf.org. So over and over again, we have to fight for our freedom. Of course, that's nothing unusual. That's the way it is in every area of life and always has been. Freedom is frequently threatened. To keep it, you have to defend it. However, in other areas of life, the debate about human rights has gone on for decades or centuries. Plenty of time to reach conclusions about what human rights people deserve and spread them around the world. Now, that doesn't mean we always manage to defend human rights. The U.S. has treated human rights with increasing contempt in the past 10 years. 
But, and that has had sad effects around the world on human rights. But at least it provides a base to try, and sometimes we win. So, that's, that's better than nothing, but computing is a new area of life. It's less than 20 years, even in the few most advanced countries, that most people do computing. And in other countries, it's less time, or not even yet. Well, that's not a long time to have a debate about what human rights a person deserves in the use of a program. But in fact, there never was such a debate. It never started because almost every user started with proprietary software, surrounded by other users of proprietary software. And that was the only possibility they knew. And everybody they knew took for granted that proprietary software was a legitimate possibility. So they accepted that too. In effect, they all allowed the proprietary developers to dictate the answer to the question, what human rights do you deserve in using a program? And the answer they chose was basically none at all. They can, di they can impose any conditions they wish. And most people accepted that. But we in the free software movement reject that. We say that we have identified four human rights that users deserve in using a program. And these are the four freedoms that define free software. But when we try to bring these ideas to the attention of the public or even the users of our system, we encounter two obstacles. First, most of the users of the GNU system don't know it's the GNU system. They think it's Linux, that it was started by Mr. Torvalds in 1991, and they admire him tremendously, and they imitate his views. And when they see the articles which describe our views, the reason we developed the system they use, they say to themselves, I'm a Linux user. Why should I read the views of these GNU extremists? I follow the admirable, pragmatic views of Mr. Torvalds. And thus, they pay no attention. And this is ironic, because when they call themselves Linux users, they mean they're using the GNU system. But they don't know it. If they knew it, if they called themselves GNU slash Linux users, then they might react differently. They might say, I'm a GNU slash Linux user, and here is the philosophy of the GNU project, which developed the system I love. I should pay attention. I should think about this. And then we would have a chance to convince them to do something to defend their own freedom and our freedom in the, in the process. And then we will be stronger, and we might win. But there's another obstacle. Nowadays, most discussion of free software doesn't use the term free software. Mostly, they use another term, quote, open source, unquote, which was a term coined in 1998 by the people who disagreed with the free software movement. During the 90s, as the GNU slash Linux system spread, many technical people recommended it to their friends because it was powerful, reliable, efficient, flexible, and cheap to operate. And they didn't talk about freedom because they didn't think of it in those terms. So there were two different political viewpoints in the community. There was the free software movement, those of us who believed that this was a matter of freedom, this was a matter of distributing software in an ethical way rather than in an unjust way. And then there were the other people, people like Torvalds, who 
contributed to free software or at least used it, but they didn't regard this as an ethical question at all. They didn't think of it as a matter of good versus evil. They just liked the software. And there was a debate between these two camps, so people coming into the community had a chance to see the debate. But in 1998, the people in that other camp coined the term open source, which had never been used before, so that they could avoid saying the word free. Because they had a new term, they were able to decide which ideas to associate with it and which ideas to leave out. So they decided to leave out the entire ethical level of the question. They present it solely as a practical issue. They don't say if you distribute software, you, have a, you are ethically obligated to respect the freedom of its users. Instead, they say if you distribute software, it would be wise to let users change it and distribute it because then they'll improve the code quality. So where we appeal to freedom and community as values, they appear to, they appeal to code quality as a value, which is a purely practical value. And they, they don't say that a program which is not open source is thereby an injustice. They only say it's likely to have more bugs. <clears throat> Well, they were the majority of the community in 1998. And in addition, the businesses in the community mostly were in their camp. Because most of those businesses, even though they distributed or developed free software, they also had non-free software products. They didn't want to teach the users to recognize that a non-free program was an attack on their freedom because then they wouldn't be potential customers for those products. So those companies started saying open source and mostly the journalists and the politicians followed the businesses and the money. And since then, we have to work hard to keep the idea of being a free software from being buried under all the open source talk. Very often people write to me saying they appreciate what I've contributed to open source and I have to correct them and say, I'm, I'm not in favor of open source. I never did anything for that. I work for the free software movement. I campaign for users' freedom and community. And uh, Sometimes I've seen articles that called me the father of open source. When I see that, I send a letter to the editor saying, if I'm the father of open source, it was conceived through artificial insemination <laughs> using stolen sperm without my knowledge or consent. Then I explain about the free software movement and its ideas, presenting the ideas that were missing in the article I'm responding to. And that's the real point of the letter, to, to show the readers why I, what I really did and what's really important for them. But I like to start it with a joke, because I like jokes, and besides, starting with a joke might, it might get the letter published. Well, I keep doing this. Every time I give a speech, I do this. But we need more than I can do by myself. We need your help. You can help simply by calling the system GNU slash Linux, especially when other people are calling it Linux, and by saying free software, software libre, because especially when others are talking about open source. Go against the current and you change the direction of the water. The free software movement has not disappeared. It has grown even since 1998, 
but it takes effort. If you add to the effort, you'll make it grow more. You can learn to give speeches like this. Then you can make a tremendous contribution. It's tremendously important. One additional speaker giving even a speech once a month makes a direct substantial difference. Because we've, even in the free software community, it's easy to lose our freedom if we don't appreciate it. The fool and his freedom are soon parted. I'll give you a couple of examples of how we have lost our freedom in the free software community. In 1992, when Linux was liberated, we got the GNU slash Linux system, and for the first time it was possible to buy a PC and run it in freedom by installing GNU slash Linux. But it wasn't easy. At the beginning, you had to tinker with it a lot. You had to become an expert in order to use it at all. People, therefore, began working on various distributions of GNU slash Linux to facilitate installation. So a few years later, there were several distributions competing in a community where most users did not appreciate freedom. So the developers of some distro had the idea to install, to add some non-free programs and present them to the users as advantages. They did it and it worked because they said, our distro can do more. And the users judged it that way. Users like me would say, those programs attack my freedom, that's no good. But we were too few. Most users didn't think of it in terms of freedom. Most users just saw it as practical advantage. So that distribution became more popular. And the developers of other distros looked at that and said, they're gaining. We have to add non-free programs, too, to eliminate their advantage. So they did that. And a few years later, all the distros were non-free. And 10 years ago, when people asked me at the end of a speech, where can I get this system, I had to respond, I'm sad to say that I don't know any place I can recommend. There are dozens of distros, but not one of them is entirely free software. In other words, we had reached freedom. We were there briefly, and then we fell back because not enough of us appreciated it enough to hold on to it. And those of us who did, we were too few to lead the community with us. Well, I'm happy to say that today there are some completely free GNU slash Linux distros. There is, for instance, Ututo, U-T-U-T-O, which is named after a lizard that lives in Argentina. And there is BLAG, which stands for BLAG Linux and GNU. And there is GNUsense, uh, which is another kind of joke. You see, it's written G New Sense, but it sounds like my job title. As head of the GNU project, I am the chief GNU Sense, <laughs> which is spelled, however, as G followed by nuisance. And then there is Triskel, which is developed in Galicia. And then there are a few more. You can find the whole list in gnu.org slash distros. But as you can tell, these are not the well-known popular distros. Those continue to be non-free. And they do a deep kind of harm to the community by giving people the wrong idea of what the goal is. You see, People who distribute a distro that has non-free software in it, they don't say, the goal is to reach freedom, and we intentionally failed to reach the goal. 
No, they don't say that. They say things like, we aim to give you the best possible user experience. They don't present freedom as the goal. And when people come into our community, often they formulate their idea of the purpose based on those non-free distros. They think the goal is to have a non-free distro which does everything, and it never occurs to them that the goal is rather to have freedom. And this is why the non-free distros are an important issue. It's not just that some people install those and they come most of the way to freedom, but they don't get all the way there. It's that these non-free distros are publicly teaching people not to make freedom their goal. And if we don't have freedom as our goal, we won't get there. And then we lost our freedom in another way. Today, the source code of Linux, Torvalds' kernel, is not entirely free software. Most of it is free software, but there are pieces which are not. They're called binary blobs. And each of them has, they have the form of a, of a long list of numbers. And those numbers are really an executable program dressed up as source code. But representing an executable as a list of numbers does not make real source code. The real source code for those programs is not available. And therefore, they are not free software. In addition, many of them carry explicit non-free licenses that don't give the four freedoms. Well, another re for either of those reasons, it wouldn't be free software. Uh, what happened here? What happened is that at some point, Torvalds decided to put those in. He never agreed with the ideas of the free software movement. For him, this is not an ethical issue. For a while, he maintained Linux as a non-free program for a year or so. Then in 1992, he made it free. And then some years later, he started putting in non-free pieces and didn't talk about it much. It was some years before we noticed this and realized what was going wrong. But for him, this was never a question of principle because he never agreed with our principles. What this shows is that when our freedom depends on somebody who doesn't value freedom, our freedom is precarious. To cope with this problem, we maintain uh, what we call Linux Libre, uh, which is our freed version of Linux. Remember, I'm talking about the kernel, which really is Linux. I'm not talking about the whole GNU slash Linux system. Those are two different levels of the issue. But for the, right now, I'm talking about Linux, Torvalds' kernel. So we make, we distribute a modified version of Linux in which we delete these blobs. And this is easy to do. We have a script which does the job. So every time Torvalds makes a new release, we make a new release a day later or so. Well, it's not a lot of work anymore. And it produces a kernel which is free software, one that we can ethically use. It does not... It does not give us free software to replace the blobs. That would be the ideal solution, the full solution to this problem. Write free replacements for the blobs. But that's hard work. That requires reverse engineering of some kind or other. So, This, is, this shows how just having a body of free software doesn't guarantee that we will keep our freedom. It's easy to lose your freedom if you don't value it. If we magically had free software today to do every job, 
we could hand this out and tomorrow everybody could install free software except when they have tyrant devices. That's another problem. But the ones whose devices are not tyrants, they could install this free software and they'd all have freedom, at least in their computing. But would they keep it? Five years from now, they might have lost it again. Someone would offer them attractive proprietary programs, and if they don't know a reason to reject them, they might accept them and lose their freedom. So to establish freedom in a lasting way requires teaching people to value freedom, which is why that's the focus of my work nowadays. Other people are writing free software. I'm teaching people, now you, about these issues of freedom, hoping that you will come to value freedom and that you will campaign in the future to defend it. Nowadays, you might run non-free programs without even knowing it because many web pages carry non-free programs written typically in JavaScript, installing them into your browser without telling you that they're do doing so. Today, the only way to stop this is to deactivate JavaScript all the time. That's what I do. However, we are almost about to release a program that will detect non-trivial, non-free JavaScript in a page. And it will check every page. If the JavaScript is trivial, it'll run. If the JavaScript is free, it'll run. And otherwise, it will tell you uh, a non-trivial, non-free JavaScript program was blocked. And uh, it will also heuristically search the site for a way that you can complain and tell people you should make your site work without JavaScript. And ultimately, I hope it will also provide people with ways to install their modifications in these JavaScript programs. However, it's now possible to lose control of your computing without ever running non-free software on your computer. The way this happens is if you let somebody else's server do your computing. This practice is known as software as a service, or SaaS. And here's how it works. The user, instead of doing her computing in her own computer by running a program, she sends all the relevant data to a server somebody else's server, where the computing is done for her by programs that she can't see or touch, and then the server sends back the results or else takes action directly on her behalf. And if you use SAS, you lose control of the computing because it's done in someone else's server and you have no control over how it's done or what it does. So it's the equivalent result to using non-free software. But it's worse than that. I explained how some non-free programs have surveillance features. They send information about the use of the machine. Well, with software as a service, the user has to send all the relevant data to the server, and the, but the result's the same. The ser some server has the user's data, and who knows what it will do with that maybe hand it out over to the FBI without even a search warrant. Uh, that's what an, a tyrannical law in the US requires. So uh, then, but it's worse than that. I told you how some non-free programs have universal backdoors allowing remote installation of changes. Windows is one example. Google Chrome is another example. It has a universal backdoor. Google Chrome is not free. Uh, and then cellular phones. Well, 
software as a service has the same result because the computing is done in the server and the server operator can always install different software in that server or additional programs to do other things to the same data and that has the eff that has the effect well first of all it's his computer he should be able to change the software in it I can't say that that's wrong but the effect it has on the user is it changes how her computing is done without asking her permission to approve the change. The result is that using SAS is inherently equivalent to running a non-free program with surveillance features and a universal backdoor. And the only way to avoid being the victim of this is not to use it you must not use SAS. Fortunately, SAS is rare among websites. If we look at all the websites in the world, almost all of them just publish information. That's not doing your computing at all. So these are not SAS. But let's look at the sites that do non-trivial services. Most of those services are communication or publication of some kind. That's not doing computing which is personally yours. It's computing that is jointly done by various people. So that raises different kinds of issues. It's not SAS. So that leaves a small fraction of, of sites that, are, that do SAS. But they do exist and they are used and you've got to be on the lookout for them and not use them. The clearest example is translation services. Those are SAS. So I won't use them. I won't do computing that's under the control of somebody else. When it's my computing on my data, I will only do it by running a free program that I have control over. I'd like to treat as the last topic free software and education. All educational activities, including all schools from kindergarten to the university, must teach exclusively free software. There are four reasons for this. The most superficial is to save money. It's good for schools to save money. And while free software is not necessarily gratis, it does offer opportunities to save money if you want to. For instance, if the Ministry of Education has a copy of a free program, then using Freedom 2, it can make lots of copies and distribute a copy to every school. Then the school with Freedom 0 can install that in every computer and run it. And because they're free to do this, they are not required to pay anyone for permission to do this, which means that there is a possibility to save money. And it's useful for the schools to save money because they don't have enough money. But this is a superficial secondary benefit. And when we mention it, we have to be careful not to let it appear to be the principal reason. And besides, some proprietary developers eliminate this possibility of cost savings by donating gratis copies of their non-free software to schools. And why do they do this? It's because they want to use the schools as an instrument to impose dependence on that program on all of society. Here's how their plan works. They deliver these gratis non-free programs to the school. The school teaches the students to use them and the students become dependent and then they graduate. And after they graduate, they're still dependent, but the developer doesn't offer them gratis copies. Oh no. And some of them, not too many anymore, get jobs working for companies. Well, the developer doesn't offer those companies gratis copies. Oh, no. In effect, 
the school is invited to direct its students down the path of permanent dependence, and they can then pull the rest of society with them into dependence. It's like giving the school gratis needles full of addictive drugs, saying, inject these into your students to make them dependent. The first dose is gratis. <laughs> the school would reject the drugs, whether gratis or not. And the school should reject the proprietary software, whether gratis or not. Because the school has a social mission, which is to educate good students of a strong, capable, independent, cooperating, and free society. And in the computing field, that means teaching them to be skilled, capable users of free software and not teaching proprietary software. Because to teach proprietary software is to implant dependence and it's the it, it conflicts with the social mission of the schools. But there's a deeper reason for the education of the best programmers. Some people are natural born programmers. At the age of 10 to 13, they are fascinated by computing and they want to learn how this software works. If they use a program, they ask, how does it do this? But if the program is proprietary, the teacher can only respond, I'm sorry, we're not allowed to know, it's a secret. And thus education cannot begin. A proprietary program is, the, is knowledge withheld. It's the enemy of the spirit of education, so it must not be tolerated in a school. A school must show its loyalty to the spirit of education by not doing things that contradict it. But if the program is free, the teacher can explain what he knows and then say, here's the source code, read it and you'll understand everything. And those kids are fascinated, so they'll read it. And then the teacher can say, if you come across any point that you can't figure out by yourself, show it to me and we can figure it out together. This gives our natural born programmer the chance to learn a crucial lesson. That code is not clear. You shouldn't write code that way. The reason this lesson is so important is that natural born programmers tend to be very clever and they can write lots of code that does the intended job but nobody else can figure out how. And that's not good programming. In order to develop from natural born programmers into good programmers, they need to learn all the things that you shouldn't do because they won't be clear to somebody else. How do you learn to write good clear code? You do it by reading lots of code and writing lots of code. Only free software offers the chance to read the code of large programs that are really used. And then you have to write lots of code, which means writing code in large programs. But to do this, you have to start small, which means writing small changes in large existing programs. The challenges of code for large programs don't appear in small programs. So writing small programs is not even starting to deal with those challenges. You start by writing small changes in large programs, and then later you write larger changes and larger changes in large programs. Well, only free software gives you the chance to write changes in existing large programs that are really used. Any school can offer this opportunity, but only if it's a free software school. You're going to miss the funniest part of the talk in about three minutes if you leave now. Just warning you, it's your loss. <laughs> uh, but there's an even deeper reason for moral education, education and citizenship. Schools must do more than teach facts and methods. Schools must teach the spirit of goodwill, the habit of helping others. Therefore, every class must have this rule. Students, if you bring software to class, 
you may not keep it for yourself. You must share it with the rest of the class. And that must include the source code in case someone wants to learn because this class is a place where we share our knowledge. Therefore, if you bring software to class, it must be free software. The school must set a good example, so it must follow its own rule. It must bring only free software to class and share it with everyone in the class that wants it. Those of you who have a connection of any kind with a school, it's your responsibility to campaign for that school to get rid of proprietary software. If you're a student, a teacher, or a staff member, or the parent of, of a student, you have a duty to act. When you do it, be flexible. Keep looking for different avenues to try. Don't get stuck on one particular avenue alone. And always raise it as an ethical issue. The worst thing you could do is get sidetracked into a discussion that considers only practical issues. This is not about how to make education a little more efficient or a little quote, better, unquote. It's about how to make education good instead of bad. <clears throat> now, I wouldn't recommend that a school, especially not a university, migrate in a week. That would cause a lot of problems that could be avoided by doing it more slowly. The important thing is that the migration should take a few years instead of a few centuries. Some talk about migrating and they take little steps and you can see that in a few centuries of little steps like that they might migrate. Obviously you have to go beyond that. <clears throat> now it's maybe interesting to talk about what I think about the about works other than software. Some works are like software in that they're designed for doing practical jobs. This includes recipes for cooking, educational works like textbooks, reference works such as dictionaries and encyclopedias, fonts for display of text, and some other things. These works must be free. The same reasons that apply to software apply to any work that you use to do jobs in your life. Freedom is having control of your life. So that means if you use a work to do jobs in your life, you must have control of those works. The users of those works must have control over those works, both individually and collectively, as they do in the case of software with free software. So those works must be free, but there are other kinds of published works. Some are statements of, of personal views, like this talk, and there are also artistic works. For those, I don't believe that uh, they have to be free. Uh, to make a modified version of a statement of personal views is to misrepresent somebody else and that's not a contribution to society. However, there's a minimum freedom we must have, which is the freedom to share. By sharing, I mean non-commercial redistribution of exact copies. We must be free to share every published work, no exceptions. In the case of art, at least, modified versions can contribute to art, but they are not urgently you, you don't have to be able to publish your modified version right away. If you had to wait 10 years, it would be acceptable. That's not the case for works that people use. You must be free to publish your modified version of a useful work immediately because there may be other people who want to use it in order to do those jobs in their own lives. But art we don't use to do jobs, we appreciate. So it's okay 
if there is copyright for 10 years on an artistic work, and then it goes into the public domain, and then people can publish their modified versions. However, there's also a practice called remix, which is not a matter of making a modified version of a particular work. Rather, you take pieces out of various things and you put them together and you make something that's totally different. Well, that simply has to be legal. If we want copyright to promote the making of works, we must not interpret it in a way that becomes an obstacle and a barrier to making new works. So remix simply has to be legal. Now, there is a proposed law in Portugal which would put a tax on some kinds of electronic equipment and give the money to, I'm not completely sure who, but if any of it goes to artists, it will mostly go to stars who are rich. And there's no social benefit in that. So this law achieves no good for society. However, if we change it some, we could come up with a law that would really improve things. Suppose that we legalize sharing, but collect a tax on internet connectivity and use that money to support artists. This could be a step forward because of legalizing sharing. But in addition, if we are careful about the right way to distribute the money, it could support artists better than the existing system. However, we have to avoid two errors. One error is to let most of the money go to businesses, because if it goes to businesses, it's not going to artists. Uh, the publishers often sign exploitative contracts with the artists, and uh, that's if we just feed the money into those contracts and they go to the businesses, we're not supporting the arts that way. Second, we've got to avoid the error of letting most of the money th of this system go to stars. For instance, suppose we measure everybody's popularity and then we distribute the money in linear proportion to popularity. That is the error. That's what we should not do. Because a star, A, could be a thousand times as popular as a fairly successful artist, B. Well, with linear proportion, A would get a thousand times as much money as B, which means either B is not getting enough to live on or A is getting tremendously rich. And either way, the system is failing. So I propose, let's use the cube root. Let's take the popularity figures and take the cube root of each one, and that will tell us the proportions for dividing up the money. So if A, the star, is a thousand times as popular as B, the fairly successful artist, A will get ten times as much money as B. Not a thousand times, just ten times. The cube root has the effect of shifting most of the money away from the stars to the fairly successful non-stars. And this way, with a given amount of money, we could do a much better job of supporting the arts. If the bill were changed in this way, it would be a step forward, an important one. But without this change, it's just a giveaway to people who don't need it. With a tiny little bit given to some who really could use it. But that's a bad excuse. If we want to give some money to them, let's only give it to them. Or let's give most of it to them. Let's not use that as an excuse to give a larger amount to stars who don't need it. So, now, oh, I should mention one other thing. On February 25th, there were protests in a lot of European cities against a proposed treaty that threatens the rights of Internet users called ACTA. For more information about the danger of this treaty, look at 
laquadrature.net. And uh, please participate in these actions. If Europeans, well, Europeans have already succeeded in convincing some governments to say no, at least for the while. So it's not a hopeless cause, but it's not to be taken, victory should not be taken for granted. You've got to join this fight now. Uh, now I will, oh, I should tell you where to get more information about GNU and free software. One site is gnu.org. That's the site of the GNU system and the free software movement. There is also fsf.org, the Free Software Foundation, where you can find various resources, various action campaigns, and you can also become a member of the Free Software Foundation. Uh, members and individual donations are our main source of income. We need your support. If you would like to join by paying cash, you can do that here. To do it with the through the site requires doing e-commerce. Uh, there's also the Free Software Foundation of Europe at fsfe.org, and that also needs your support. You can become a member of that. Uh, please support our work. So now, I am St. Ignatius <laughs> of the Church of Emacs. I bless your computer, my child. <laughs> Emacs started out as an extensible text editor that I wrote, which became a way of life for many users as it was extended so much they could do all their computing without ever leaving Emacs. And then it became a church with the launch of the news group alt.religion.emacs, which you might find amusing to visit. In the church of Emacs, we have no services, only software. We have a great schism between several rival versions of Emacs, and we also have saints, but fortunately no gods. Instead of gods, we adore the one true editor, Emacs. To be a member of the Church of Emacs, you must pronounce the confession of the faith. You must say, there is no system but GNU, and Linux is one of its kernels. <laughs> then, if you become a real expert, you can celebrate that with our ceremony, the Fubar Mitzvah. in which you chant a portion of our sacred scriptures, in other words, the system source code. <laughs> we also have the cult of the Virgin of Emacs, which means anyone who has never used Emacs. And uh, according to the Church of Emacs, offering the Virgin the opportunity to lose Emacs virginity is a blessed act. <laughs> we also have the Emacs pilgrimage, which consists of invoking all the commands of Emacs in alphabetical order. <laughs> uh, 
There is a Tibetan sect that holds that it's adequate to do this under program control, running a script, but uh, the mainstream church believes that you only get spiritual merit if you type them by hand. <laughs> the Church of Emacs has certain advantages compared with other churches I won't mention. For instance, to be a saint in the Church of Emacs does not require celibacy. <laughs> but it does require living a life of moral purity. You must exorcise all the evil proprietary operating systems that have possessed computers under your control or set up for your regular use and then install a wholly free operating system <laughs> where holy can be spelled in more than one way. and then only use and install free software with and on the system. If you make this vow and you live by it, then you too will be a saint and you will have the right to wear a halo if you can find one because they don't make them anymore. <laughs> People have sometimes asked whether it is a sin in the Church of Emacs to use the other editor VI. It's true that VI, VI, VI is the editor of the beast. <laughs> but using a free implementation of VI is not a sin, it's a penance. And some have asked whether my halo is really an old computer disk. This is no computer disk, this is my halo. But it was a computer disk in a previous existence. <laughs> so thank you. Now it's time for the auction. Now it's time for the auction. I am going to auction this adorable GNU that needs a home for the benefit of the Free Software Foundation. If you are the buyer, I will be happy to sign this card for you. And if you have a penguin, you need to get a GNU for it, because as we know, a penguin can't hardly function without a GNU. <laughs> we can accept payment either in cash or using a credit card. If your credit card, if the debit cards that have to be put into a machine to process the chip, that we can't use. But if you can use it for telephone orders, it should work for us. Uh, and also, I'll be here answering questions for a while, like 20 minutes or so, probably. So you've got time to go out and get cash from a machine um, if you need to. So when you bid, please wave your arm and shout the quantity because you want me to notice, right? What good is it to bid? If, if a bid is made but the auctioneer doesn't notice, did the bid really happen? So I'm going to start with 20 euros, <laughs> which is about the, the usual price. Uh, do I get 20 euros? How much? 20. I've got 20. Do I get 25? 25? I've got 25. Do I get 30? I've got 30. Do I get 35? I've got 30. Do I get 35? How much? I've got 35. Do I get 40? How much? I've got 40. Do I get 45? I've got 40. Do I get 45? How much? Uh, 45? I've got 45. Do I get 50? Who said, who spoke? 
I've got 50. Do I get 55? How much? I've got 55. Do I get 60? I've got 60. Do I get 65? I've got 60. Please be silent if you're not bidding. Please be silent if you're not bidding. I need to hear people who are bidding. I've got 60. Do I get 65? I've got 60. Do I get 65? 65? I've got 65. Do I get 70? I've got 65. Do I get 70? Do I get 70? I've got 65. Do I get 70 for this adorable canoe that needs a home? I've got 65. Do I get 70? Do I get how much? I've got 70. Do I get 75? I've got 70. Do I get 75? Do I get 75 for this adorable GNU that needs a home? Do I get 75 to the Free Software Foundation to defend freedom? Do I get 75? Do I get 75? Last chance to bid 75 or more. Do I get 75? 75. Do I get 80? I've got 75. Do I get 80? I've got 75. Do I get 80? How much? What? I've got 80. I'm hard of hearing. You need to shout for me. I've got 80. Do I get 85? I've got 80. Do I get 85? Do I get 85 for this adorable canoe that needs a home? Do I get 85 to the Free Software Foundation to defend freedom? Do I get 85? Last chance to bid 85 or more. Last chance. Do I get 85? Do I get 85? Going going, gone for 80. Please come down. So now it's time for questions. Now it's time for questions. By the way, when you leave, are, where are the, uh, the pins and buttons being sold? Up there? Yeah, so when you leave, you can take stickers, and you can also buy pins and buttons from the FSF. Uh, but meanwhile, it's time for questions. I am hard of hearing. You need to speak loud, clearly, and slowly for me to hear. And it would be, if you've got a microphone for Can people to ask, please wait a minute, wait a minute, hello, please stand here and people can queue up to ask questions. That system works much better. Don't try to take the microphone all around. It takes a long time to get it from one person to the next. It's so boring. Another advantage of the queue is once you get in the queue, you've got your position. It's much fairer. You don't have to depend on somebody to recognize you. You come down, you get in the queue, and you, you got, you're going to have your turn. So I'm going to sit down here. So uh, you, you've got the microphone, so the queue's there. Well, uh, who's got the other one? So come down. OK, I mean, I don't mind if we have two queues. I can switch between them. I think he's waiting, right? <laughs> but even with the microphone, you've got to speak loud and clearly and slowly. Um, hello, um, this is about the, um, the GNU slash Linux um, nomenclature, but it's not the usual question you, you get and that you're probably tired of, of answering about. 
Um, uh, this is about, I mean, the, the Free Software Foundation's goal um, is to, at least the way I see it, it, is to promote free software and to ensure that use, use users maintain their freedom in operating software, yeah. right? Um, and I was wondering that if you don't think that correcting users when they say Linux is actually more harmful to making them join the FSF's cause, um, ju just wait a minute, just let me finish, um, because uh, by correcting them, you're you're not you're not really um, making them see the the way. Usually, you're saying, "I'm on the GNU, I'm on the FFS, FSF side, and I care about things like naming." Um, well, you might misinterpret it that way, but if so, that's just uh, you know everything has you know there's there's a drawback to everything we do is this is necessary because the practice of calling the system Linux spreads the open source philosophy. Yeah, but and I, this is so, this is such an important effect that by comparison whatever drawbacks there are are, are minor. Um, I, I just think that um, regardless of it being right or not, if this is, regardless of the system name, that that insisting so much on the nomenclature makes the FF, FSF about a naming issue, about the credit no, issue, rather than, you, rather than no, about spreading true. free software. That's not true. You might see it that way, but that doesn't make it true. So you're not worried about losing people that would I'm otherwise... I'm not, because... That would, all, would otherwise look, look, be sympathetic. Look, give me a chance to respond, okay? I've heard this, I've heard this a hundred times. And saying it at greater length won't make it any clearer. Absolutely not. I'd rather have one person who is determined to fight for freedom than ten people who are lukewarm, weak supporters. And people who think that the system is Linux and resent it when we call it GNU slash Linux, they're not supporting us very much. So. What, if, what support we might get from them is not important. It doesn't make a big difference. So in some, the FS, to be accepted by the FSF, you need to agree on all points, otherwise you're not welcome. No, but to be, tr to be considered, basically, if you were mistreating the GNU project by it, giving the credit for our work to someone else, we will not think of you as treating us well. You've got to, tr this, is the, this is something we're entitled to. Yeah, I, we're not I, I don't entitled think it's... to your agreement on polit politics. You can disagree with us, that's your right. But if you're going to give the credit for our work to someone else, there's no reason we should do anything with you, and yeah. we won't. I, 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 I'm not so much about... about I think you about made your point. Give it to the issue? next person. Okay, uh, thank you. <laughs> If you want to ask a question, come up and get on the queue. Are, the, are you waiting to ask? Yeah. Well, then ask. Here, here. Uh, we'll both. One question that side, okay. one question this side. Well, actually, I have a number of questions anyway. Um, well, don't ask more than two of them and then give it to the next person. Okay. I'll try to be snappy snappy. Um, I would like to have your opinion on um, Android, Canonical, and Google path towards evil corporation. Sorry, these are. Sorry. I don't like it when people mock me by mocking things I didn't say. No, 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 no. I, I'm I not mocking I don't call you. them evil corporations. I judge the I, things that they do. I didn't say that. I, did, I, Isn't I it said what he said. I said um, Google's path towards evil corporation. Oh well. But that's my opinion. Yeah. The point is, okay. But I don't look at things in those terms. I look at what they do. And some okay. parts of what they do are good, and some parts of what they do are bad. But you've just given me three questions. There's Android, Canonical, and Google. Exactly. Well, Android is, at least in principle, a free operating system, but it's not complete. There is no device that you can run with the free software released as Android. Uh, they all require non-free drivers, libraries, and firmware. 
So, okay, it's a step in the right direction, but it doesn't get there. Uh, the next thing is that in many cases, because most of Android is released under a non-copyleft license, these products may come with executables whose source code is not available to the user. So those are non-free modified versions of free programs. Uh, the next point is many Android devices are tyrants that don't allow users to install different software at all. And uh, in addition, they all come with some non-free applications from Google. So while it is a, an important step that gets a lot closer to being able to run those de a mobile device with free software, uh, there are a number of remaining problems. Um, and then there is Canonical. Well, Canonical develops the non-free GNU slash Linux distro Ubuntu. And as I've already explained how that gives people the idea an idea of the goal, which is just convenience, not freedom. So I don't think that's a good thing. And then Google in general, well, Google does various things, some of which are okay and some of which are bad. Uh, Google services tend to require or at least try to get the user to run non-free JavaScript <coughs> programs. Until a few months ago, it was possible to use YouTube without JavaScript enabled. And then they changed it, so now it, rec it won't run at all if you don't allow the non-free JavaScript to execute. And therefore, the only way in the free world to look at anything from YouTube is with the YouTube DL script. Okay, um, just on, on Canonical, uh, by the way, and th this is a topic for discussion for everyone. Um, uh, I, I get in the, into uh, a lot of arguments with other people, um, especially with uh, people coming from businesses who argument that, uh, argue that uh, you can't monetize free software, so it's Ugh, not good for business. what a horrible word. Exactly. Ugh. But that's their word, not well, mine. Well, I will and, use um, it. <laughs> okay, so we can bleep uh, free software. And I'm, I'm trying to reach some sort of solid argument to convince these people that, that, that is, it is actually beneficial for their businesses to use free software for them and for their well, clients. Well, okay, these are so, two different questions. Uh, it's beneficial for them to use free software because they deserve to have control of their computing. Now, develop free software is a different question. I won't argue in general that, they, that it's profitable for them to develop free software because after all, I don't know any of the details of the, any specific case. How could I reach that conclusion? Uh, and I'm not going to say that every developer of proprietary software could make more money by making it free. I, mean, I haven't argued for free software on the grounds that that's more profitable and I won't, I mean, I'm, I don't think that Microsoft would make more money from Windows if it were free software. I, I don't really know, but I can't make that case. My case isn't about what's more profitable. My case is about what's ethical and what's an injustice. Non-free software is an injustice. It's wrong to develop it, and it's foolish to use it. So the users should reject it. They should firmly refuse to run it, and make those companies go broke. <laughs> now, in some cases, they can make money from developing free software. There are plenty of companies that do. Uh, a few years ago, I was told that the free software companies of France employed 10,000 people. I don't know whether it's more now or less. I haven't heard. But uh, that shows that there is the possibility. After all, most paid software development is custom software, where one client is paying to someone to write the software that client wants to use. Well, if the client is not a fool, it will insist on receiving the full control over the software it paid for, meaning it will be free software in a trivial way. Well, that's ethical. There, that's free software business right there. So it's certainly possible. 
The reason I reject the word monetize is that means convert into money. What if you could monetize food? It would mean that you'd convert the food into money and then nobody could eat it. You see, people shouldn't convert something into money. That's not the same thing as making some money from making a useful thing. That's why I object to the word monetize. Next. Um, let me introduce myself. I use GNU Linux. My uh, input application is Emacs, but I am no saint. I use Wolfram Mathematica oh, to I'm do math. Oh, I'm very sad. Okay. Um, and my question was already uh, answered. Uh, I would like to know the direction to make money with free software. Well, I, I just told you one of them. Okay, okay. They're companies That's that develop solutions and in the process, they improve some generally useful free software. Uh, there are also big companies that fund some free software development. In addition, governments fund lots of software development, and they ought to insist that the software must be free. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I have two, two questions. Uh, the first one um, is uh, regarding something uh, you, you said um, uh, about the problems about the upcoming versions of um, uh, computers which will be locked to Windows, for example, and the situation... Well, not necessarily. Microsoft wants to do that, but we may be able to stop them. So go to fsf.org and sign our petition, for one thing. Exactly. And um, besides that, there are also other situations of uh, locked uh, hardware. Uh, for example, uh, we have uh, graphics that drivers which uh, require binary blobs uh, to operate. Initially it was NVIDIA and A ATI, now uh, um, ARM, ARM, graphics, ARM uh, graphic cards for uh, ARM processors also require uh, well, actually, binary Actually, there was just a tremendous advance. There is a GPU called Mali and someone just developed a free driver for that. Yes. Um, and I'd like to know if uh, s uh, these situations, uh, these, um, these principles, um, um, if there are, if there are uh, initiatives to promote and also um, to enforce uh, not only uh, free as in speech software, but free as in speech hardware with open specifications well, actually, and... I'm, well, I'm not in favor of making anything open, but uh, free hardware designs are not yet useful in most areas because we don't have the way to convert them into hardware. The exception <laughs> is when, you're, when it's a design for something to be made with a 3D printer. Though the 3D printer d designs for ma things to make, when they are things that are useful, they must be free. Uh, but uh, you can't make a chip that way. So we, we can't make our computers with today's 3D printers. So it wouldn't do us any direct immediate good to have free designs for computer hardware. What we need is spec hardware, documented hardware. The problem is when the hardware specs are secret. And I think that that should be illegal. Those who sell you the hardware should be required to tell you how to run it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, the, second, the second question is um, you uh, talked about Google Chrome, how it is not open. Uh, no, I said it wasn't free. Oh, uh, I don't yeah, say that I, things are yeah, open or I'm not. I'm sorry. Uh, Mistake, my mistake. Um, you said uh, Google Chrome it w uh, is not free. Um, and um, we have situations in which, for example, the WebKit in engine is uh, free software, but still we have a tremendous problem in um, the HTML, HTML um, and CSS world in which, for example, uh, mobile phones um, are having the tremendous op problem that even though they have free software um, for uh, the rendering system of HTML, uh, the people are still being locked into specific engines due to the proprietary vendor extensions that are being used. Do you think there should be additional requirements 
in such well, situations requirements for... on what on whom i think it's a bad thing it, it's basically it's bad to push somebody else to use a non-free program and this is something people should complain about every time and maybe we can make it easier for them to complain maybe we can organize campaigns uh, but this takes work. Maybe you'd like to do some of this work. It takes organizing. Okay. Um, I have two questions. Uh, one of them was already. I can't understand the sounds you say. <laughs> you need to pronounce your consonants clearly so I can hear them. All right. Uh, I'm sorry. I have two questions. Uh, one of them was partially answered already, so I'd like to focus on an aspect so, of it. Without apologies, please. Go straight okay. to the question, please. Uh, when it comes to the, the gen general market, uh, the, the, the program market for general public, uh, the, the current market system, the, the current, uh, uh, the way the things are today, I think you will agree that. Yeah, I can't hear the consonants now. You, at the beginning, you were pronouncing them clearly, but you have to keep doing so, so I can continue to hear your words. <laughs> All right, uh, I'll try. Uh, I'm saying the way the market is, is I think it's clearly uh, uh, works towards uh, a proprietary software. Is yes. Correct? Okay, so uh, if I want to produce something for the general society, uh, how, do you, uh, how can I make uh, a free software that is sustainable uh, for me as well, a developer. Maybe you can't. Maybe you have to. Maybe all you can do is work on it as a volunteer. But at least that's ethical. Whereas the proprietary software is an injustice. So this is a common thing. People say, I have a choice. I can either do this much work on free software or this much work on proprietary software because if I did the proprietary software, I see a way I could get paid, and if I do free software, I don't, I'd have to do some other job. Which one is better? Well, it's better to make this much of something good than this much of something harmful. So work on free software as a volunteer, get some ethical job, perhaps custom free software, perhaps sysadmin, you know, there are lots of ethical jobs even in the IT sector, uh, just don't develop proprietary software ever. Right. And if you, know, if you need to make some money and there's no job for making free software, I understand you'll need some other job. And that may leave you only some of your spare time to work on free software. Well, we still appreciate it. It's better than nothing. But proprietary software is worse than nothing. See, this comparison comes from a mistaken assumption. When people assume that what we want is software, and they see I can make this much software if it's free and this much if it's proprietary, it might look like this is better. But when you realize it's this much evil, this much unjust power, or this much liberation, well, you see, this is positive and this is negative. Here's zero. This is positive, this is negative. What's better, to make the world a little better or make it a lot worse? Okay. Uh, the other question I have is about a completely different... I can't hear you now. <laughs> the other question I have uh, is about another, another different issue. Uh, relating to Facebook, uh, a few months ago, uh, Zuckerberg uh, had a, a, a public release uh, claiming that uh, how he treated the, the, the data, that it wasn't harmful and it was... Well, he can say what he likes. Okay. Why should I bother responding? No, what, I'm, what, I'm, what I want to, to ask you is, uh, when you say that Facebook is evil, you mean it's potentially evil? Or no, it's a surveillance engine. <laughs> okay. It's collecting lots of data about people, and I don't want it to collect that data about me. But there are other bad things about Facebook. For instance, face, if you click on a like button for a product, your face could be used in advertisements for that product. Facebook does that. That's another nasty thing. The, another nasty thing. 
If you look at a web page and you see a like button, whether you click on it or not, just if you see it on your screen, that means Facebook noticed that your IP address visited that page. So this is surveillance you may not even be aware of. And this surveillance applies to people even who are not Facebook users, have no Facebook accounts. They're still being surveilled by Facebook. Now, Facebook is not the only company that does this. Google Plus is starting to do the same thing. Well, it's equally bad no matter who does it. There are many bad things about Facebook. Look at stallman.org slash facebook.html. Good afternoon. Way, what time is it? What time is it? What? Okay, I'll do a couple more p questions. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Maikan. I'm from social sciences. So uh, I Nothing couldn't understand 99% of, of these questions, but anyway. Really? Because this is not technical. Do, is that really true? You couldn't understand? No, I could understand some stuff, but not much. Um, That's extremely disappointing. Sorry. Uh, However, this is our big problem. I don't know what to do. Okay. Send me a dictionary and I will <laughs> see everything. Um, I, have, I have a question about freedom on the internet because I'm, I'm making a, an investigation about anonymous. And my question is about the ethical um, actions of day taking because we, we defend... The ethical uh, actions of what? The ethical. Uh, if he's et ethical? To do what? Uh, to hack um, websites and well, because they want you know, what freedom. Do you think hacker, what do you think hack means? Uh, to invite, probably. I'm afraid you have just fallen into, unknowing, into a rather painful dispute. I'm here to, see, to learn with I'm you. I'm a hacker, which means I enjoy playful cleverness. Yes, but... Hacking is playful cleverness. Yes. Now, there are people who use the word hacking to mean breaking security. Yes. But I object to that meaning, and so I won't use the word in that, with that meaning. Oh, and but what I is the meaning for that? Cracking. Cracking. Okay. But uh, whether that's bad or not depends on the details. But you think it is uh, ethical and moral to, to, to crack? A website. So it depends on details. Okay. Sometimes it's bad. Sometimes it's okay, depending on what they do. I'm, t I'm talking about specifically about anonymous that group. Well, anonymous doesn't what, what is break your personal security. Thing? Anonymous, it, with its actions, doesn't break security. Anonymous carries out protests that are the virtual equivalent of a protest on the street in front of somebody's building. Okay. And I think that that's, that's perfectly legitimate. Okay, that's everything I need. <laughs> there is another group. There is another group called Antisec, which does other kinds of actions, and I think some of those are okay and some of those are bad. It's bad when they collect personal data and dump it out because that can lead to a harm to lots to bystanders. Uh, good evening. I can't understand you. Speak clearly, please. Uh, uh, it's working, but that's not magic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Claudio and I, have a, and I have a question. I can't hear anything. I can't hear anything you say. I, I have just a question. Uh, GNU license uh, means that the software is free to distribute and uh, all the freedom levels that you said before. Well, they're not levels. They're four freedoms and they're all necessary. But yes, the GNU general public license gives users the four freedoms. In other words, it's a free software license. But there are other free software licenses too and every one of them gives users the four freedoms. Uh, imagining that I run a, a company that uh, makes a free software uh, under the GNU license uh, and I publish the software with uh, 
imagining in the in the help button uh, there's an about menu saying uh, that I have a sponsor for example the company A, a yeah. sponsors me uh, what do blocks other users to edit my source code and remove the sponsor? Well, actually, in the GNU GPL, there is a provision in version three of the GNU GPL. It says you can say that that notice has to be preserved. Uh, those um, Creative Commons license uh, are according with the GNU license. No. Creative Commons says you should not use its licenses for software. The only license that Creative Commons recommends for software is the GNU GPL. Thanks. The Creative Commons licenses, by the way, there are six Creative Commons licenses. Two of them are free licenses. The, other are, the others are not free. But they're all meant for things other than software. Hello, it's a, my name is Adriano Fons. It's a pleasure to meet you and to be with you here t today. My question is simple. Uh, it's not about liberty because we already discussed it. And, uh, if you and could get straight to the question, because yes. I would like <laughs> to answer more questions in the time um, I can. Regarding the, um, the interfaces right now, uh, the, the web interfaces with JavaScript, uh, the interfaces with um, Android uh, and, and Google, what do you think, you, what is going to, well, not to win, but uh, to, to prevail? Uh, I can't see the future because it depends on you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's a right answer. Thank you. So, well, I can do one more question. Yeah. Is it working? Okay. Uh, regarding proprietary file formats, um, I can identify two things that make um, a file format proprietary. One, it's secret, and we don't know how it works, and two, patents that forbid implementations. Um, you get the example of MP3. Now, MP3 is forbidden uh, by patents yes. on certain countries. Yes. Um, is it a legitimate issue uh, using that file format in countries that are not affected by patents? Ah, interesting question. Well, first of all, there is free software that can produce and play MP3. However, because of the patents, many distributors of GNU slash Linux don't include it because they're afraid they would get sued. As a re and some of them actually recommend non-free software to do that job. The result is, if you make an MP3 file, and well, if you know that the only, if you're in a country where it is not patented, and the distros that people are using in your country have the free software, and you're pretty sure that the MP3 files you're making are only of interest to people in your country, then there isn't any harm done. But that's not likely. Basically, People distribute MP3 between countries, and they should be using Og Vorbis instead, because that way they won't be pushing other people into a jam. Okay, thank you. So I guess I have to stop now. Yes, so one. What, what time is it? It's five. Oh, do you think I have time for two or three more questions? Just the, the last. Okay. Do I do? Please. Okay, then I'll. Uh, simple, not complicated and technical like the others, just straightforward. Uh, in terms of the, <laughs> the talk, thank you for, for, for teaching us about the free software. And, and my question is basically, um, what are the major barriers, the major enemies, in your opinion, for, for free software? Because according okay, to, to your talk, answer, everyone. Let me ev answer. Well, can, can I finish the question? Okay, because if you must, but my understanding is that uh, human beings, by nature, we are, we are all bad, and we fall into the temptation of using proprietary software. Obviously, uh, that's, that's what is happening in major corporations and, and major uh, software houses that develop uh, I don't agree. products. Why, why, I don't agree. Why do you think there's still a need to fight, and why do you insist oh, well, into look, that? Look, let me get to the answer, okay? 
Uh, first of all, in the Church of Emacs, we do not believe in original sin. We don't believe humans are all bad. Uh, that's not what's going on. What's going on is social inertia. Social inertia pushes, it's a current that flows and sweeps people to pri proprietary software. Now you can swim against the current if you try. You can go sideways, you can get out of the current, but, uh, but most people don't. And that's why most people use proprietary software. Now once you have this concept of social inertia, you can see lots of instances. For instance, schools teach proprietary software. Businesses use proprietary software. And each one says, we are doing it because the other does. So businesses say, we'll switch, we, we might switch under other circumstances, but we couldn't switch now because the schools are graduating people who know how to use proprietary software. And the schools say, well, we teach proprietary software because that's what the businesses use. And they have this irrational idea that unless they teach the proprietary software, their graduates can't get jobs. Well, they might have, if they couldn't, they might be, they would only be at a disadvantage if they were unable to learn. But they shouldn't look for those jobs anyway, is the point, to really teach them. So, but the point is, each one of them is saying it's, it's hard for us to switch because the other is, do, is doing something bad. So each one's waiting for the other, and if it goes on like that, neither of them will ever change. Well, who's the one who has to change first? Obviously, the schools have a responsibility to change because the schools don't exist just for their own success. Businesses can say businesses exist only for their own success. They can tell the rest of society to go to hell. Uh, but schools can't. They can't pretend to tell the rest of society to go to hell. So the schools have a duty. Basically, how do you get out of social inertia? Somebody has got to make the effort. Somebody has got to get out first. Because as long as you're going along with the current, you are part of the current that's pushing everyone else. So if you can get out of the current and if you understand, then you, it's your responsibility to do so. But there are other forms of social inertia. For instance, the fact that computers are sold with windows in them. Uh, and in most cases, in most countries, uh, the purchasers have to pay for the Windows license. There were just some victories in France where an organization called AFUL has been fighting this. They got several court victories requiring stores to give people back the, what they paid for Windows licenses. Okay, just two more quick questions. Hi, uh, I was wondering about the uh, programs that collect data. Uh, if you would be okay with, with free software that collects data in a transparent way, I mean. Well, I don't, the, the point is free software would only do that if the users want it to. Because if they the didn't want it to, they would change it. Right. But I mean with the objective of improving the, 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 the software, because there's, there's a noble objective in collecting well, okay, the data, right? The point is, I want the users to have control over that. I'm not saying that you should refuse to ever give any data about your activities to anybody. Sometimes you want to. Sometimes you, ha you want to tell somebody something for a specific practical reason. That's as I do too. I'm not saying that you should never tell anybody anything. But with non-free software, it could be collecting data that with, and you don't know it. And even if you knew it, you couldn't stop it. Right. With free software, if you don't want it to send data, you can stop it. So so you can make it lie also. What I mean is it wouldn't be nefarious if it was made by a free software, right? If it's done in free software and people, can, people see it and they know it and they accept it, then it's okay. okay. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, what are the main differences between uh, GPL2 and GPL3? There are several. It's, I can't list them all. Uh, Just one, the main. Well, that's the point. There are several main differences. 
And there are around, there are like hundreds of small differences, but there are around 10 main differences, and I don't remember all of them. Uh, it's better internationalization. Uh, we made an effort with GPLv3 to pay attention to what it would do in European legal systems and other parts of the world. Another is it, if someone violates GPLv2, he loses his license immediately. So if you were to distribute a GNU slash Linux distro in a, the wrong way, you would lose your license from tens of thousands of different copyright holders and you'd have to find them and ask them to forgive you. But with GPL version 3, it works in a gentler way. Anyone who, any copyright holder who sends you a complaint can later terminate your license, but it's not terminated automatically. And they have to send the complaint within a certain period of time. If you correct what you're doing wrong, then, and, and 60 days go by, anyone who has not complained yet can't complain anymore. Which means that you have received a fixed set of complaints and those are the only copyright holders you have to ask to forgive you and you know how to contact them because they just complain to you. So it's feasible. Um, another thing is GPL version 3 deals a lot better with patents. Uh, anyone who contributes to the code gives a license for all his patents that cover the code of the version he distributes. Another thing is that GPL v3 blocks tyrant devices. It says if a product is sold with this software, then they have to tell you, the purchaser, how to install your modified version in the product you own, such that it will really work, such that it has a chance to work, just as the, their version works. Uh, and this is an important thing. And by the way, this is the change that Torvalds objects to. The reason Torvalds will not use GPL version 3 on Linux is he wants to permit tyrant devices. He told me so. <laughs> okay, uh, we will finish now and we thank you your presence here in Sinfo and we have a small gift for you. to sign the GNU later. So I have to go now to do interviews? Uh, with press, yes. yes okay, you can sign it. You before can... I do, I, I better sign the GNU, except that my, the marker that works for that is in my bag. It's okay which... if you sign it there, it's a, okay, no problem. So the, if the purchaser of the GNU would come along, then I can sign it there. Okay. He'll come. Okay, and, and this is for the press. Uh, Uh, vamos ter uma, uma conferência de imprensa uh, ali fora, pedimos a todos os elementos de imprensa presentes que saiam por esta porta de baixo. A todos, a todos os restantes participantes, pedimos que permaneçam aqui mais uns momentos. Eles sabem. Eles sabem como todos têm. Vamos... Ok, espero que tenham todos gostado. Vamos sortear um voucher para um computador, uh, para um tablet. Já, já não estou